Welcome to this session on interfacing. Any microprocessor application requires data to be transferred between the microprocessor and external circuitry. In this session, we shall cover how to interface an input-output device with the microprocessor. We shall discuss in detail the process of data output to seven segment displays and data input from matrix keypads. As you know, the 8085 microprocessor provides a 16-bit address bus, an 8-bit data bus, and a few control signals. The primary control signals used for interfacing are the read, write, and IO slash M, which are available on the microprocessor hardware pins. These three signals are usually decoded to generate the I.O. read, I.O. write, memory read, and memory write signals. The 8085 microprocessor is capable of addressing 64 kilobytes of memory and 256 I.O. ports. The in and the out instructions are the only instructions that enable an I.O. data transfer. Let us look at the block diagram of an input interface. Usually, an 8-bit tri-state buffer is used as an input port. When this buffer is enabled, data is transferred from the input peripheral to the microprocessor data bus. When disabled, it tri-states, which frees the data bus for other devices to do data transfers. How do you generate this port enable signal? You first have to decode the intended address from the lower 8 bits of the address bus. This is the same address that you would use in the in instruction when you want the microprocessor to read data from this port. This device address is passed with the I.O. read signal which is generated upon execution of the IN instruction. As both these signals are usually active low, inverters have to be used for proper ANDing. The NAND is used to generate the final port enable signal which is also active low. Let us probe the device select and the I.O. read signals on an oscilloscope. We are executing an in from port 0 in a continuous loop. You can see the signals on the screen. This is the active low device select signal which is decoded from the address decoder. This is the active low I.O. read signal. The actual data transfer occurs at this rising edge. The port propagation delays are of the order of a few tens of nanoseconds and are insignificant here, where the excess time is of the order of a microsecond. Let us look at the block diagram of an output interface. An 8-bit latch is usually used as an output port. The latch output is connected to the peripheral and the input is connected to the data bus. The device address is decoded from the lower 8 bits of the address bus. The I.O. write signal is used here for ANDing the device address. The port latch enable signal here is also active low for the positive edge triggered D flip flops. Let us probe the device address and the I.O. write signals. 
we are executing an out from port 0 3 in a continuous loop. This is the active low device address signal which is decoded from the address decoder. This active low signal is the IO write signal. The actual data transfer occurs at this rising edge. We have discussed the process of interfacing an input and output port. To sum up this process, all data transfers occur through the bidirectional data bus. The interface must ensure that only the intended peripheral is active and enabled. It must also ensure that the data transfer with each peripheral should not interfere with other peripherals connected to the data bus. The design of device selection logic can vary depending upon how many IO devices are required in the system. A 3 to 8 decoder can be used to generate device address for 8 devices. Here the lower 3 bits are connected to the A, B, C inputs of the decoder. The decoder has 3 enable pins. G1 is active high enable and G1B and G2B are active low enable. A3 and A4 of the address bus are connected to G1B and G2B. A5, A6 and A7 are inverted and anded to generate a high when all three of them are low. The Y0 to Y7 outputs of the decoder are active low for the port address 0 to 0, 07. This is because the lower three bits A0 to A2 are decoded only when A3 to A7 are all low. This scheme of device address decoding where unique addresses are assigned to ports by decoding all 8 address lines is called absolute addressing. These output device addresses are to be anded with the IO read or IO write signals to generate the port enable signals. Let us look at a simplified scheme using the 3 to 8 decoder to generate the final port enable signals. Here A0 to A2 are connected to the A, B, C inputs of the decoder. IO read and A3 are connected to the G1B and G2B inputs. The G1 enable pin is always high. The address here is decoded using the A0 to A3 lower nibble and the anding is done with the IO read or IO write to generate the required port enable signals for port 0 to 7 at the Y0 to Y7 outputs. As the upper nibble A4 to A7 is not used for address decoding, the decoder would be enabled for all 0 to F values of the higher nibble. The ports would be enabled for 10 to 17, 20 to 27 and so on up to F0 to F7. This multiple addressing form of decoding is called linear addressing. When you use linear addressing, you must take extra care to ensure that more than one ports are not selected simultaneously. 
let us exhaustively generate 64 port enable pulses using 9 3 to 8 decoders. Outputs of 8 3 to 8 decoders numbered 1 to 8 are used for generating this port enable signals. The lower three bits of the address bus A0 to A2 are connected to the A, B, C inputs of these decoders. One of the enabling inputs common to these decoders is the IO read signal. The individual enable signals are generated from the 3 to 8 decoder numbered 9. The address lines A3 to A7 are connected to the input and enable pins of this decoder. Here, decoder 1 is enabled through Y0 of the decoder 9 for the address range 0 to 07. The decoders 2 to 7 are enabled in subsequent blocks of 8 port addresses. The 8th decoder is enabled for the address range 38 to 3 F hex. In real world applications, 7 segment LED displays are used to display information from the microprocessor. The 7 segments A to G with the font arrangement is like this. These displays are of two types, common anode and common cathode. The common anode is connected to plus 5 volts. The LED segments are connected through current limiting resistors to an output port, usually an 8-bit latch. Here, A to G segment lines are connected to the latch lines corresponding to the data bus D0 to D6. Sending a 0 lights up the corresponding LED segment. Sending a 40 hex to this port would display a 0 on the FND. As the output is latched, this display is maintained till it is updated by writing another value to the port. For displaying a 1, you have to send 79 hex which will light up the B and C segments on the FND. You can display 0 to 9, A to F and many other funny characters by lighting up the corresponding segments. As there are 7 segments, you may have 2 raised to the power 7 or 128 combinations that can be displayed. To display one or two FNDs, it is practical to use this approach where each digit has its own port. What do you do if you have a large number of digits to display? We use a technique called multiplex display. Here each digit is turned on in succession. Here digit 1 is turned on. Here digit 2 is turned on. Here digit 3 is turned on and so on. Digit 1 is refreshed here. Digit 2 is refreshed here and so on. Let us look at the interfacing of a 4 digit multiplex display. Here the 7 segments of the digits are connected through current limiting resistors to the output port, port 1. 
the common anode connections of the digits are switched to plus 5 volts through the PNP transistors. The base of these transistors is controlled by another output port, port 2. Sending a logic 0 turns on the transistor and the segment data at port 1 is displayed on that digit. To send a 0 on the leftmost digit, 40 hex is written to port 1, then the digit transistor is turned on by sending 0 e hex to port 2. This status is normally maintained for about 1 millisecond. Then the required data say 1 is sent to digit 1. This is sent by first sending 79 hex to port 1 followed by sending 0 d hex to port 2. This status is maintained for 1 millisecond. Then the data say 2 is sent to digit 2. This is sent by sending 2 c hex to port 1 followed by sending 0 b hex to port 2. This digit is on for 1 millisecond. Then data say 3 is sent to digit 3. This is sent by writing 30 hex to port 1 followed by sending 0 7 hex to port 2. This digit remains on for 1 millisecond. This process is repeated and goes on continuously for all the digits. The refresh rate must be greater than 100 hertz in order that the human eye sees the display continuously on. Practically, multiplex displays are refreshed at frequencies greater than 1 kilohertz. This technique allows the decoding and drive circuits to be shared among the digits. The 1 millisecond refreshing of the digit is usually implemented by a 1 millisecond timer interrupt. The interrupt routine has to service this interrupt of digit display at every millisecond irrespective of the updation of the display. This refreshing is a software overhead and has to be accounted for in the performance of the system. Of course, there are display controllers like 8279 which offloads the processor from this refreshing and are used in high performance systems. We shall now discuss the process of interfacing a 4x4 matrix keyboard using an output and an input port. The 4x4 keys are arranged in 4 rows and 4 columns. The rows are pulled high and are connected to the output port, port 1. These lines are called scan lines. The columns are also pulled high and are connected to an input port, port 2. The columns are called return lines. These are the scan and return signals for a valid key depression. Active low pulses are repeatedly sent on the scan lines and are sensed by the columns. For a valid key depression, row select pulse is sensed by the corresponding column. In addition to repeatedly scan the matrix keypad, the scan algorithm should provide for 1. Debouncing, 2. A single key being operated several times, 3. A single key pressed 
and held for a long period of time. The software overhead in scanning the keyboard can be traded off by using hardware keyboard controllers which interrupt the processor whenever a valid key press is detected. Any instruction that references memory can also transfer data between I.O. device and the microprocessor if the I.O. device is assigned to the memory address space rather than the I.O. address space. In this case, the I.O. port is simply treated as a memory location. Let us compare I.O. mapped I.O. and memory mapped I.O. The device address in I.O. mapped I.O. is decoded for lower 8 bits of the address pass. In memory mapped I.O., generating unique address would be expensive because they would have to be decoded from 16 address lines. The control signals for I.O. mapped I.O. are I.O. read and I.O. write, whereas for memory mapped I.O., they are memory read and memory write. A very wide choice of instructions can be used for the memory mapped I.O., which is limited to in and out only in I.O. mapped I.O. In this session, we have discussed the process of interfacing I.O. devices with the microprocessor. We have also covered the process of interfacing seven segment displays and matrix keypads. In the subsequent session, we shall discuss memory interfacing and analog interfacing. With this, we end up this session.